32nd Sunday in Ordinary Time A reading from the first book of Kings. In those days, Elijah the prophet went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the entrance of the city, a widow was gathering sticks there. He called out to her, Please, bring me a small cupful of water to drink. She left to get it, and he called out after her, Please bring along a bit of bread. She answered, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. There is only a handful of flour in my jar and a little oil in my jug. Just now I was collecting a couple of sticks to go in and prepare something for myself and my son. When we have eaten it, we shall die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you propose. But first make me a little cake and bring it to me. Then you can prepare something for yourself and your son. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, The jar of flour shall not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry until the day when the Lord sends rain upon the earth. She left and did as Elijah had said. She was able to eat for a year, and he and her son as well. The jar of flour did not go empty, nor the jug of oil run dry, as the Lord had foretold through Elijah. The Word of the Lord. reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Christ did not enter into a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the true one, but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. Not that he might offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have had to suffer repeatedly, from the foundation of the world. But now, once for all, he has appeared at the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ offered once to take away the sins of many. 
will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. The Word of the Lord. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. In the course of his teaching, Jesus said to the crowds, Beware of the scribes, who like to go around in long robes and accept greetings in the marketplaces, seats of honor in synagogues, and places of honor at banquets. They devour the houses of widows and as a pretext recite lengthy prayers. They will receive a very severe condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and observed how the crowd put money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow also came and put in two small coins worth a few cents. Calling his disciples to himself, he said to them, Amen, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the other contributors to the treasury. For they have all contributed from their surplus wealth, but she, from her poverty, has contributed all she had, her whole livelihood. The Gospel of the Lord. The first reading comes from 1 Kings 17, 10 to 16. This is the story of how Elijah the prophet is sent off by God to the city of Sidon, which is a pagan city. And in that city, he encounters a woman gathering sticks who's going to make a little befoot, who's going to make a little fire to cook her last meal with the flour and the oil that she still has. A famine is going on in Israel and in Lebanon, and there's nothing to eat. In fact, she intends to eat that cake that she makes, give a little to her son, and then they will die. Elijah asks her for some food, and in spite of the fact that she really has nothing to offer, she offers what little she has. In fact, this will be the tie-in with the gospel, the idea of a widow offering what little she has. Because of her generosity to the prophet, her obedience to the word of God, God will reward her and multiply the oil and the flour that she has. So until the day that Elijah leaves her, they will have enough to eat. The second reading is from Hebrews 9, 24 to 28. In this passage, we hear about Jesus, the high priest, who enters the sanctuary once and for all. Unlike the high priest, who continuously have to offer their offerings of animals, shedding the blood of these animals so that we might obtain forgiveness of sin. When Jesus offers himself, it is effective. He only has to offer himself once because his blood shed has removed all of our sin. Now some Protestants attack Catholics and say that because they celebrate the Mass over and over again, they are repeating the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And this reading says it should only happen once. The response to that is to say that it does only happen once. When we celebrate the Eucharist, it's not that we're sacrificing Christ once again, but rather we're participating in that one celebration, that one event. That when we celebrate Mass, we pass outside of time. So we're at the Last Supper, we're under the cross, we're at Easter. This is an awful lot like when Jewish people celebrate the Passover. When they read the Passover account, they believe they pass outside of history, outside of time, to be present at the event. And likewise, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we pass outside of time to be at that first Eucharist. The Gospel is from Mark 12, 38 to 44. Jesus, first of all, condemns the scribes who walk around with long robes, sit in the front places in synagogues, eat the prophets of the widows, etc. They want to be seen, they want to be thought of as holy men, but their faith is really not authentic. It's all show so that they'll be esteemed. And then he speaks about somebody who has a true faith, a poor widow who gives two small coins. She gives very little, but Jesus says in the eyes of God, 
she has given more than the people who have given great sums, because they gave out of their surplus. She gave everything she had to live. Remember, God judges us not according to what we do, but according to what we're capable of doing. Not all of us have received the same gift of faith. Not all of us have received the same talents. We're responsible to use that gift, those talents, in accordance with what we've received. If we receive very little faith, then maybe the fact that we struggle with our faith and we do the best we can is a greater thing than those who have received great faith and never had a doubt in their life. Those who have received great talents, God will expect more of them. So it's very difficult to judge others because we really don't know what gifts they've received or not. We should look at what they do, but not judge whether in God's eyes they're better people or worse people. We leave that to God. And may God bless us. Thank you.